Whoa! Choose night, choose night. Welcome, everybody. I hope there are lots of you out there. I'm really looking forward to tonight. We have uh, discussion points. Today, we're talking crumbly cheeses. Crumbly cheeses are some of Britain's very, very oldest, and they're a style of cheese that's pretty much unique to these islands, which is quite interesting because one likes to think that the making of cheese is very broad and, and that we've been importing recipes and styles from the continent and we haven't developed much ourselves, but actually this whole spectrum of crumblies is uniquely us. I'm going to talk about that tonight. But the other cool thing that my guest tonight is John Farron. John Farron heads up the Guild of Fine Food. The Guild of Fine Food is the um, uh, granddaddy of cheese in the UK. It's probably over it a bit, but they run the World Cheese Awards, the biggest competition for cheese anywhere in the world, anywhere in the world. I'll let him talk to you about that. How? Let's bring him on. John, welcome to the team. Are you there? I'm certainly here, Charlie. I'm ready with my... Um wonderfully stacked cheese board and uh, looking forward to talking cheese with you actually thank you very much thank you very much well that is that is the reason we're here um you've actually got comfortably the most beautiful arrangement of cheeses that we have seen on tuesday night is cheese night i think you've done that wonderfully yeah my own work um, and i what pictures behind you what have you got going on there uh we've got what do we got what do we got i'm i'm in I'm, I'm in the office i am allowed to be in the office we we are essential workers key workers uh, that is San Sebastian, you can see behind me, uh, World Cheese Awards dinner uh, up there. I'm not sure if you can quite see that, but that uh, in 2016, we uh, rejudged, if you like, brought together a lot of people, brought together every uh, world champion cheese we've ever had since 1988 and had a, uh, a very eminent panel of judges to look at those again, which was quite fun uh, to see what had won over those 30 odd years. Uh, mm -hmm. And that is a no, uh, that is uh, Kraftke, the Norwegian winner uh, in 2016. So yeah, we've got um, a bit of a bit of a gallery of past world cheese. So you like to surround yourself by cheese, but even when you're sitting at your office doing your Excel spreadsheets, it, that, that that's true. Doing the logistics, which is what I do, move things, move food and people around the world. So mm -hmm. less romantic, but uh, a good thing. But more of that later. Well, I'm sure, yeah, no, um, uh, people out there watching, if you've got any questions about the World Cheese Awards, uh, John's going to tell us a little bit about them around the 8.25, 8.30 mark. Um, but let's, let's, let's interrupt ourselves with good cheese. So I believe we've got the same four cheeses in front of us. At least that's if the magic have, has, has worked out. Yep. Um, so let's introduce the, the stars of the show, the cheese. Right, today we have dun, 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 Cornish Yard famous for its nettle covering, produced by Lina Dairies uh, in Cornwall, sort of south of Truro, that kind of direction. Um, uh, and this is this is an interesting one, John, isn't it? Because it's sort of both ancient and modern in some respects. Yeah, I, it's, uh, I love Cornish Yarg. It is um, one of those lovely stories where a recipe was found in an attic um, and this purports to be a very ancient, well, it is a very ancient recipe, um, but was discovered, in, I think, in the mid to late 80s. Um, and so actually sort of had a, a rebirth, if you like, the Cornish Yarg. Um, and, and very normal for cheesemakers over the centuries to wrap, cover, wash their cheeses in things to help them uh, be preserved, really. As we all know, cheese ultimately is, is preserving the goodness in milk. Um, before we had fridges and freezers and all that sort of thing. So they would have wrapped uh, or washed things in. And, and one of the most distinctive cheeses and one of the, our most distinctive crumblies or territorials because it is wrapped in nettles. And they really are nettles. You often see some of these cheeses really being yeah. wrapped in something artificial or made up. But they are picked and they have people called nettlers who go out picking their nettles each year, uh, storing them up when they're out of season. Uh, in uh, I'm freezing them so they can keep wrapping their cheeses all year round. Nettlers, nettlers. That's an interesting job I have never heard of. They don't offer you that when you're doing career advice at 16. Um, now, I mean, I, I've heard a story that the reason that they use nettles is because Cornwall wasn't a very rich county back in those days and cloth was too expensive. Is, is that true? Could be, could be. Yeah, yeah, it kind of could figure. I mean, I'd like to think that someone along the way decided that there's some of the, the flavor 
from the nettle and it does impart itself especially around the obviously around the edges where that where the where the uh, you can see there's a slight sort of color differentiation there that those those bits around the edges will always have that that sort of slight vegetal note to it um, so I don't think it was done for the flavor but you could also be right um, it could be a way of, of, of saving a wee bit of money and using what's around you um, I mean fundamentally these these cheeses the terror the crumbies the territorials call them what you will they are meant to be indicative of of the region or the area that they are from they're meant to absorb some of the flavor of the soil the environment uh, what what's growing around them um the french call it terroir um and hence that link with territorials but that that's what we're we're hoping for in these cheeses charlie is to get a bit of flavor of their environment so you think we're going to taste a bit of cornwall tonight yeah yeah i think right. that's a nice way of putting it um, well, uh, we'll quickly introduce the other cheeses and then we'll get back and start tasting the corn. Now, the one we've got in the middle is a uh, Butler's, a uh, Butler's Lancashire. But I understand this one is 18 months old. I mean, I, I love Lancashire, fantastic cheese, but I've always thought it was younger than that. What do you think? Yeah, um, new to me as well. Um, typically, you're right, sort of six, eight months. Um, and normally a Lancashire would be made over two or three days. I don't know if this one is. Um, mixture of curd. Um, distinctive because, as we know, Lancashire, the weather changes an awful lot. Every day is different, as it is everywhere, really. Um, and that will relate to the curd and the milk and, and give it a distinct flavour each day. And some would say each milk, morning and, and evening milk, will give a different characteristic to a cheese. And a good cheesemaker will know how to use that milk from different days and different times of the day um, to to yeah. make a, a cheese that often has a really good sort of 3D flavour to to it. Very com can be a very complex cheese, Lancashire. It is a strange one, Lancashire, because they've got methods of, of making cheese up there that aren't found anywhere else in the UK. Um, we'll get on to how it tastes, but I mean, this cheese looks to me like that cross between traditional styles with modern technology, yeah. modern innovations to bring cheese into the 20th, 21st century now. Um, I mean, there isn't any question that our palates have changed in the last 500 years. What we eat alongside our cheeses has changed in almost the last 500 years. And the cheeses, all cheeses have evolved. And it's going to be interesting to taste that one where it's, 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 it's brought some innovation, traditional recipe. And the last one, we've got, we're not going to touch the blue for the moment. The last one we've got is um, uh, Paul and Sarah Appleby's classic Cheshire. I don't know if you can see that. Very distinctive colouring, one of the few coloured cheeses in the UK. Um, this one you can see is has been cloth wrapped. You can see the distinctive cloth patterning sitting on the on the edge there, with a little bit of mould and yeast build up on the outside, um, and that is beginning. You can just see the beginning of the breakdown just inside the rind, where it gets a bit darker and a bit creamier. Um, I this this is this is very old school, John, isn't it? Yeah, I mean this is we, we talk about cheese making aristocracy and this probably probably is it uh appleby's cheshire i mean cheshire like cheese. You that. what they like you saying that aristocracy and cheese well they're, they're, i mean this this cheese is allegedly uh was mentioned in the doomsday book it was fed to the romans i mean that it, it has that sort of age uh in, to it in terms of how long it's been made but yeah up in in in, in cheshire and shropshire made up there and Applebee's have been making it for a long, long time. And when we taste it, we'll hopefully be getting some of the saltiness that you will find typically in the salt sort of plains up there in that part of the world. So I'm quickly gonna mention a few of the other crumblies which we're not tasting tonight. So classically, we talk about the crumblies as including, correct me if I'm wrong, John, we'll be talking the Wensleydales, the Caerphillies, yep. um, uh, Stilton is a crumbly. Um, a, a single Gloucester, maybe that's yeah. sort of borderline, and and the classic characteristic of a crumbly is obviously a crumbly texture, not that close density you would get off a cheddar, and it's achieved through the cheese making process of having a high acidity in the early stages, which, brief for technical moment, washes out some of the bonds between the casein micelles. Okay, stop the technical moment. Back to talking about cheese. So let's eat. Let's eat. Let's start with the kafili, yeah. um, not the kafili, the, uh, the Cornish art. So do you eat the rind? Do we think we eat the rind? 
Uh, I think you do as you please. Uh, That's the right answer. I'm going to not. I, I, whatever you do, you want to be eating. You want to be eating it right up to the rind, even if you don't fancy the nettle. But um, <laughs> have you gone through? You probably must in previous episodes of this, Charlie. You must have gone through how to warm up the cheese and smell the cheese and all those things. You've probably done that already weeks ago. Uh, as one of the leading judges on the planet, John, I think this is a perfect time for you to talk about. <laughs> you would advise your judges to I was gonna say, consumption. I, I certainly wouldn't. I wouldn't call myself one of the leading judges of the world, but we organise the World Cheese Awards indeed. But, yeah, I mean, you're, you're obviously looking to open up this cheese. Um, we all know never to, to taste cheese straight from the fridge, in, in, unless in certain exceptions with fresh cheeses. But what you're doing is, is warming it up, bringing out the flavors, um, opening up the cheese. And um, that way you're going to find and get the most out of it. Um, and what are we getting here, Charlie? Well, um, I'm getting, uh, I think butter is, is the top of my dairy list. I think I'm also getting kind of a little bit of uh, a cottage cheese and I'm getting a little bit of cream. And because it's Cornwall, I'm thinking I'm getting a little bit of clotted cream, but that could just be association. Yeah, no, I'm definitely getting top of the milk. Absolutely right. That sort of I'm getting top of that milk. That sort of creaminess. Um, I, I don't know whether it's in my in my head because we talked vegetal, but there's definitely some green vegetal brassica in there, there uh, um, from from that. Yeah, I and mean, that that is that is that is actually very very good. Um, I a, cheese, a cheese like this, um, which is is bringing together a series of what you might call the gentler flavors or the milder flavors. Um, can quickly be swamped. The reason we're tasting it first can quickly be swamped by big flavors, and the complexity on a gently well constructed cheese like this can be lost. Which, and I think you know, take your time on a cheese like this. It is really, really worth it. I think that's a, a really good point, and and I think perhaps some of us have lost. We're looking for big, bold. Dare I say it? Sometimes a wee bit blunt flavors. In, mm. in our cheese and in, in our food generally, actually. And, and you're right. It's a, a lovely reminder that actually delicate and gentle can mm -hmm. be excellent. As long as that length of flavor is there, that still keeps going, nagging away. There's that tiny little bit of lemon, or am I imagining it? I don't know, a little bit. I'm definitely, lemon. I'm definitely lemoning. Yes, I am. Um, um, I, I also think that in the, in the flavor journey, the first half is dominated by the dairy end of the spectrum. And the second mm. half gives more of those vegetable flavors, very mild, very leafy, spinachy, nettly, those kind of things. Um, so not big cabbage, that kind of stuff, but the gentle nettle flavors. Um, so if you eat the second piece too quickly, you're just going to be topping up your dairy flavors, if that makes sense. You need to settle it into the mouth and then get the full experience. I well, think that, that's going to be a sort of eight, nine week old cheese, I would think. Yeah. Um, can go a wee bit longer. Um, even even at six weeks, though, it, you can eat it, and it's obviously a wee bit fresher. Uh, probably more lactic, more more creamy, um, or, or milky at that point. But yeah, that's a really really good cheese. I um uh oh, this is my it's my favourite profile. What they've got here. Um, when you get the older yogs, which it, it ages relatively quickly, this cheese because it's got so much air inside and that kind of. Thing. Um, uh, it's it's a cheese that I think that I like the young flavor, the, the, the last hint of lemon and that sp those spring notes, which I like very much. Mm. So eight or nine weeks, John. Let's put do the maths. We're in May, so this is a March cheese. You think an early March? Yeah, middle. Yeah, mi yeah. I'd say so. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, let's taste the nettle because we're professionals, and it's our job to find these things out. Doesn't taste a huge amount. It's got. A little bit. It's just like hints of bitter, actually, um, but not particularly nettly. And no stinging, no stinging nettles for those people who are concerned that any, you know, mouths might be harmed in making the show. Good. So we've got a good number one. Um, I say, and uh, John, you obviously know why it's called Yarg. Um, do we want to share that with our assembled people? Oh, I'm sure we do. I mean, it, it sounds wonderfully Cornish, doesn't it? As if it's some no. old. Cornish word, but you, you speak the beat. It makes you want to slap on a bit of woad and go and make war with some Welsh people or something. <laughs> but it's not true, is it? 
Not true, not true at all. Uh, Mr. Gray uh, found the recipe in the loft for Cornish Yarg. Uh, Gray backwards is, of course, Yarg, uh, and I, th I believe was the was the original cheesemaker in the, in, in the eighties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there you go. It's like true born mint it's made by Mr. Robert. It's um, uh, it, it's this Gray backwards. I like the woad answer, but you know itself it's great it's a fantastic yeah, product. it's good it's good to have that personality though i mean it's same with all these cheeses you'll see names we'll talk about the names of either the cheese maker or of the farm or where it's from and again i think that's important that's all part of that terroir thing is is the name of the maker or the name of the farm folks should be looking for that when they're buying their cheeses yeah yeah now uh, it's worth saying that if you want to learn more about this stuff the academy of cheese is a fantastic training organization. I have to keep popping this in there to make sure you all know that you need to be joining us on our Academy of Cheese courses. And you can do it through e-learning. You can join my webinar course. I believe the next one begins on the 3rd of June. So sign in with me and we do just like this, but we talk in cheese. We have the cheeses to taste in front of us. But John, you, uh, your Guild of Fine Food does training on the Academy of Cheese yeah. and you're a bums on seats kind of guy, aren't you? Yeah, we're a bums on seats kind of guy, which is not much of that happening at the moment but yeah we like to get folk in a room um and we have about 12 to 15 people on a, on a training day we're current we we have three courses uh though for those one aimed uh, at those who sell cheese are more of a retail focused course and then we do the level one and level two academy of cheese courses um most of that takes place at our our training room and facility right by borough market so uh, a lovely excuse when we're allowed to get out and do stuff uh it, come and see yeah. us, uh, in london se1 yeah no it's, it's a, I'm, I'm a bit involved in that i do some of that stuff with you um it's a great venue to to come and learn about cheese because obviously borough market is just a reservoir um right cheese number two let's let's dug in so we're looking at this um innovation on classic lancashire it's a traditional lancashire but they're pushing it out to 18 months um, and let's see what they're doing. Right, so again, you can absolutely see why it's called crumbly. I'm coming back at you, Mr. Camera. I'm like, I bought myself a new camera and I think that it's better, although it's just not seeing that probably. Sorry, there we go, that, that's getting it. Come on, focus, there we go. So that slightly open texture where we're not pressing the, the curd too much together, leaving it what you might say space to breathe, which is really nice. Mm. Mm. Lancashire traditionally made um, over two or three days, as I said earlier on, to get different makes of milk, get some complexity to the cheeses. Um, I'd be looking for some, you know, there is some butteriness there. You want some butteriness, some of the floral notes, again, from uh, the flowers that they'll be grazing on, the wild herbs, that sort of thing, which you also see in a, in a Wensleydale. Uh, where the cows there are, are on sort of SSSIs grazing on those wonderful wild herds, but that Lancashire has a has a has a, a different finish for me. It's it's slightly um, marmitey. There's that sort of savoury sweet yin and yang going on at the end. Yeah, there is. There the is. Um, it's it is and, sweet and sour, isn't it? It's it's, it's sweet and yeah. sour. It's really interesting. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, sourness is a classic Lancashire Cheshire characteristic. Um, the high acidity is true of all crumblies, but you're getting it, they've combined it with, I think that they are engendering more sweetness than you would get off a, a, a really old school Lancashire. And that's giving a really big, complex recipe-like flavor, isn't it? Mm. Yep, yep. You'd, um, I bet this would make good cheese on toast. That kind it would of make excellent thing. cheese on toast. That's very, very true. Uh, this is a, a, a butler's, isn't it? Sorry, you, you were lost in Mimi land. Oh, was I sorry? Uh, mm -hmm. Butler's Sunday Best. I think that this one they grade out. Um, so they'll they'll be when we say grade grading, they'll go in and be checking their batches of cheeses. And someone who knows what they're talking about will be looking at the cheese, listening to the cheese, tasting the cheese, uh, and they'll know because they've got years of experience which ones are going to go the distance. So they'll they'll be <laughs> judging it. Up Three, you know, a month, three months, six months, just to see which one can go the difference. And it's true of a lot of cheeses that are mature for a long time. You have graders checking them. <clears throat> this is got. Uh, this is eighteen months old. I think you said, Charlie. Mm -hmm. um, and um, 
they'll, they'll have known that this one could go the distance. And that's why perhaps we're getting that sort of interesting um, sort of sweet and sour I finish. I agree. You, this is this is not a flavour profile that's typical of the younger cheeses. This is only what we're going to get if you hold it back, let the flavours begin to bubble up and cauldron-like inside the wrapping to to get yeah. these interesting long-term flavours. These long-term flavours. It's interesting. I mean, like they they even there are three grades of Lancashire. There is the what they call the crumbly, the tasty, and the creamy. And the they seem very nondescript words, but in fact, there's a very specific that the creamy is a naught or four months to 12 months. The tasty, a four to 12 weeks, pardon me. The tasty is 12 weeks plus. And with a lot of these crumblies, there is a tipping point, an early tipping point at that three month mark where you go from a, a quite a highly acidic, and I often use the word feta style, that's really unfair on those cheeses, but it allows people to sort of envisage that slightly moist, obvious curd, big gaps, acidity cheeses, um, into when it begins to transition towards more savory notes, um, the herbaceousness comes in, and this is the same cheese just growing into its clothes as it gets older. And those are the two classic styles. Um, the, the crumbly style is, 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 a, is another take again when we're not using um, that multi-day curd, we're going for an early punchy acidic flavor. Um, and it seems like the Inglewhite Dairy at, at the Butler's have, have said, look, three's not enough. Let's find a new way to make Lancashire have interesting flavors. This is really good. Yeah. Another uh, excellent um, Lancashire, Kirkham's Lancashire, which we know, again, you're looking for that that name, that family name. The Kirkham's have been making Lancashire for a long time. Uh, yeah. That's Cloth uh, Lancashire, that one. So... Um, just, just, just ask a cheese shop when you're buying some cheese, and just ask them who's made it, where it's from, who's the farmer. Who's the Producer really matters. You want to get one that's made in the Lancashire area. I mean, where Inglewhite Dairy, we're talking 20 miles from Blackpool. I mean, like it's properly up there. It's just under Beacon Fell, and I don't know if you know, but the PDO for there is a PDO, a product designated origin for Lancashire, is the Beacon Fell Lancashire cheese, and this dairy is. Ooh, I don't know, a mile from there or something. That's really at the center of Lancashire land, if that's not a tautology. Right. You ready to go one more, John? Mm -hmm. Yep. So okay. I've gone ahead. My apologies. Um, I know this cheese extremely well, Sarah and Paul Appleby. Um, uh, and, um, and I think it's got so many characteristics which are uh, unique in, in real terms, in real terms. So do you want to have a comment? I'll get it up to the camera and uh, you can talk about what you're seeing. Yeah, again, be I mean, beautiful cheese. Let's have a look at the rind at the cloth. Um, that, I don't know how you can see it. That, that's often a work of art, those things, that, when they sort of get a wee bit older. Um, this cheese, probably 12, 12 weeks old. I'm already getting up front a saltiness which we talked about a wee bit earlier, that you would get the so that sort of characteristic from the area, from Cheshire. But it's not an unpleasant saltiness. It certainly isn't a sort of whack you in the face, sea salt kind of, I've swallowed, I've fallen into, into the sea and swallowed a load of water. It's a lovely, gentle saltiness uh, that just keeps going. And then you're picking up a little bit of, uh, a little bit of citrus again, some buttery notes. But as with the yard, it just keeps going along uh the flavor profile is is long but it is delicate there aren't any horrible punch you in the face flavors there that's a, a real real gentle beauty that i i think this is a, a this is a cheese that i the older i get dare i say it the more i love this cheese this wasn't a mm. cheese for my um i, I ho hope that doesn't offend anybody um but i find that there for all against all cheeses, this the the classic Applebee's Cheshire has, has relatively few dairy notes. So, and I think that what it delivers is almost like a hoppy bitterness that sits in a vegetable bitterness. Um, mm. I, I'm fascinated by bitterness because I think that it's one of those flavors that just can tip you either way so quickly. Badly used, it just awful. Correctly used, it reaches into a lot of other interesting complex flavors and and that gives it a gives a a platform for hoppiness, for chocolate, mm. for a lot, lot of other things, mm. and gives it sort of a bit of welly to some of those flavors, which I really like. Um, and I and, and and you know, it's worth mentioning that the saltiness you're talking about, John. There, it, it is in theory coming from the Cheshire Flats, which have these big salt rock bodies 
underneath the grass. And there were various cheshes made in the old days and what along the, is it the Weaver River? I can't, I think it's the Weaver River, where they would get different cheeses during the summertime because these would be meadows that would be unpasteurizable, uh, unpasteur. You can't feed cows there, whatever. Um, but during the winter, because they're too wet. So they come in, lots of milk being made and they would push these cheeses. So they're looking to make cheeses during those summer months that will take them through the winter. So very territorial, like you're talking about, John, very specific in that sense, the salt, the, the meadows, all that kind of stuff. We're not even talking about the Romans. I mean, no, we don't, no, we don't need to talk about the Romans. And, and, and then again, with these right, cheeses, right. That reflect, their, reflect their, their ground and their terroir, if you like, it's so much mm. more satisfying to drink something with them that's similarly from that area. Hence, mm. you'll, you'll, you'll put a cider with a decent cheddar um, and, and that sort of thing. I'm amazed, actually, how many um, – I'm, I'm actually having a cider, um, a small cider – how many ciders around the world, not just here in the UK, but wherever we seem to hang for the World Cheese Awards, where there's a culture of good cheese making, there is often also a culture of, of great cider making as well. And the two go hand in hand, sort of made together and, and similarly tasted together. Absolutely beautiful. Well, nice segue onto the uh, the World Cheese Awards, John. I could have, could have primed you for that. So... Um, we're taking um, uh, we're taking questions on the World Cheese Awards. Do you want to just give us the, the, the 101? I mean, like, is it really the whole world or is it just like British people pretending it's the whole world? No, 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 no. It's, it would be un silly of me to say it was the whole world, but um, certainly we have more, more entries from more countries um, than most. Um, last year we had entries from 45 different countries, um, but it's not just about the cheese, although we, we've got to... I think we've got 14 consolidation points around the world. So the cheeses get sort of put together uh, as far away as Australia, South Africa, uh, America, South America, um, and then obviously most of Europe. They get sort of brought in together to one point wherever we are that year. Uh, and for the last 10 years, we seem to have dotted around major cheese-making cities of Europe. Um, but it's not just about the cheese, as interesting as that is. And we get some extraordinary cheeses from really small cheese makers. Um, but it's about the people as well, our judges, of which we have about 200, 250. And again, they're from around the world. So last year we had uh, judges coming in from Japan, uh, from Russia, uh, from the USA, from, from Barbados, some really obscure um in terms of cheese making terms, some obscure places. And that for me is what makes it so colorful uh because the cheese world comes together yes to celebrate artisan cheese makers because we take our job very seriously about judging the cheese and, and giving out gold silver and bronzes but also just to sort of get people in the same room for 48 hours and talk cheese and a little bit of business gets done and a lot of quite fun is sorry it's Quite a lot of business gets done. I mean, you have, uh, I, I can't remember the exact number. It's around 300 judges doing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, About three yeah, two and a half thousand. We've got, last year we had 3,700 entries. Um, so, yeah, pretty big. And that's all cheese. Um, we, don't, we don't really have time or room uh, to do butter and yogurt and other things. So, we, we are just focused on the cheese. Um, and, yeah, we, we, we have. A wonderful celebration but it is important that the cheese makers from across the world get a light shined on them and, and that is why in 1988 it was started to try and protect uh and and to highlight uh artisan cheese makers who then were having a tricky time and of course now are having a tricky time yeah they are, yeah, they are. but i mean if i remember rightly you can't get cheeses from some countries there are sort of environmental health blocks and that kind of thing yeah, yeah, yeah. We had a, we ha we have issues most years with certain countries. Um, last year we had some problems getting our South African cheeses into Italy. Um, yeah, it's it's it goes with the territory, Charlie. Uh, that's what we have to do. Uh, mm -hmm. Moving cheeses, uh, especially raw milk cheeses, from all corners of the globe is not easy. But um, when we get it right, we get them in. Um, people can experience some amazing things. We've had cheeses from Australia yeah. um, covered in ants, 
yeah. uh, we've right. works of art from from South Africa where we've got um, beautiful drawings uh, on the on the rind of the cheeses. I mean, the, it, it you know, tr um, trips over into to art on occasion. It, it, well, we were talking to Jamie Montgomery a couple of weeks ago, and the question was, does he think himself more of a scientist or an artist? And he would definitely say it's the art of the game. It's the art of the game. It's the managing of the of the the unknown, the chaos, and and that kind of in, instinctive team peacemaker skill that makes it happen. I mean, yeah. uh, I remember that one with the with 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 the ants on top. Um, and you're just going, is this is this just someone just trying it on? You know, is they just want attention? And then you taste it, and it was lemon, lemon bean. They were green ants from Australia, um, and they were awesome. It was an amazing cheese. I think it got a gold, didn't it? I mean, it was a yeah. very again, just like the yarg. They are using what's around them, what's in their environment. What can we wrap the cheese in to help preserve it? And mm -hmm. and by accident, probably in in the first place, give it some flavour. And and um, they hey presto, you're, you're you're gathering up ants in Australia somewhere. Um, but <laughs> yeah, I mean... <laughs> yeah, of course you are. That's exactly what you do. So, I mean, have you got a, a favourite moment from the World Cheese Awards that you would uh, like to tell people about? What, what's, what's, what, I, don't, what's I, don't think I've got, I don't think necessarily here I've got a favourite moment. Every year, just the coming together of, of the people and the cheeses is, is extraordinary. Uh, and it's how people... Yeah, take it incredibly seriously. We, 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 our judges work very hard at the appearance of the cheese, the body. Then they're looking at the body and the texture of the cheese, and then the aroma, uh, and and then obviously flavour and mouthfeel. And and does it does it taste great? Is it is it excellent? Um, and they do work hard at it. But yeah, it, it's it becomes a fun occasion as well uh, too, and and so it should do. Uh, and and and, and this is going to ask the question which I actually do know the answer to, but it needs to be asked. Um, hmm. Why isn't it just subjective? Why isn't it just I like that cheese? Why? Why do you need judges? I mean, surely cheese is there for fun. Why? Well, yeah, there is an element of fun, but I think we all we all have to accept that some people know more about some things than others. Um, I, I know less about opera or or classical music, and and there are book prizes, there are prizes for dogs, there are prizes for everything. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and our panel of judges who, who come from around the world are, are cheese buyers, they write about cheese, they're cheese makers themselves, they understand cheese. So we have to accept that their opinion uh, and their palates, uh, their trained palates, probably can recognise better cheeses than Joe Public, I, if you like. Um, is, that said, is, that said... Ultimately, things have to, to, to taste wonderful too. Uh, and, and as you rightly put it, there is an incredible balance between the science and the technical side of cheese and the romance and the art side of it. And though you get, you get quite a divide within the, the cheese world between the two in some ways. But actually, if we're honest, when the, the two come together and mm -hmm. are executed brilliantly, that's when you get an award-winning cheese. And... and I think that it's easiest to show is when you see people coalesce around an agreement and they go, oh my God, this is amazing. I mean, the recent winner, which was David Grammel's um, Rogue River Blue, there was a proper sit back moment and go, this is amazing cheese. This is on its day. And the other thing that we have to recognize the World Cheese Awards is that it's got to be right right now. It, it can't be right tomorrow. It can't be right yesterday. It's got to be right now. And they might have come all the way from Australia or South Africa or, you know, Somerset. You know, we might be doing the awards in Bergen in Norway. And it's got to get – how do you get the perfect soft cheese to – so there's a huge amount of judgment that goes on. And I find that um, beauty breaks through. Do, 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 do you know what yeah. I mean? Like when you're – when you're watching the cheese tables, you can see bubbles of excitement as people go, oh, are you? And they, you know, I, I walk tables in my role as sort of commentatory person, and people go, Charlie, Charlie, gotta taste this. And it's amazing when these are amazing cheeses. Yeah, yeah. No, you're, you're absolutely right. And it does, it, it, it causes euphoria. I mean, we've, we're actually quite lucky here because. Uh, Cornish Yarg grabbed a gold last year, 2019, as did the Applebee's Cheshire. Uh, not uh, not this particular cheese, but butlers have done rather well as well. 
uh, last year. They've got a goal for their Trotter Hill and a goal for their Kinderton Ash as well. So, I mean, there's some there's some award-winning cheese on our cheese boards right now, which is good, good to see. Okay, I've got a few questions. Um, when is the best season to pick nettles? Um, no idea, um, and I, I'm just guessing it's probably about now. Um, certainly in my garden, nettles are big, but what they need is the big leaves, the little leaves. You can imagine a complete cup. They then, I do like that cheese. Um, they then, uh, they then scorch them, uh, you know, scald them, and freeze them. So then I've got Jill Dye. What's the tr what's the trick of eating a crumbly? It makes quite a mess. Do it on your own in bed. Right answer. Uh, and Alison Tuck, are there good members of the public? To, are they? Are they good for members of the public to visit? Um, uh, Alison, where are you wanting to visit to? Um, Probably the World Cheese Awards. Okay, tell them about that, John. Yeah, yeah, we can. Every year it's it's co-located with a, 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 a festival, a cheese festival, or in fact a wider food festival. So uh, last year in Italy we, 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 we had sort of food from that uh, region of, uh, of Italy and a festival to celebrate it and the public are allowed in um, so it's a, a bit of a, a bit of a, a travel a bit of a journey but yes you're all very welcome just on the point of the the, the nettles I wonder if there is another cheese that Lina make which uh, uses wild garlic leaves I always think the younger leaves uh, often give the most flavour. Certainly, when you make a pesto with with garlic leaves, they're better when they're younger. So, a, a wee uh, bit earlier. Yeah. Than that. Don't know if it's true of nettles. I don't know enough about that. But I would assume the younger nettles might give a better flavour. But I don't know. Good one to find out. Um, I've got a lovely response on the how do you eat uh, crumbly cheeses from Charlotte. Uh, put it on an Eccles cake. I think that is clearly the answer. <laughs> today. So, Eccles cake and cheese and language adventure all round. Um, I'm going to say thank you very much, John, for coming on, telling us about the World Cheese Awards. Uh, it is a pleasure to, to go to them. It's one of the greatest events of the year. And I'd like to thank the makers of these cheeses. So we've got the Applebee's, the Butler's, and uh, the Line of Dairy, Catherine Mead. Thank you very much for your cheeses tonight. Um, thank you, everyone, for watching. And I hope to see you next week. Next week, we've got our first of what I hope you're a regular thing of the Tour de, de Fromage de France. So we're going to look at the massive Central and talk about the cheeses of, of Central France um, and, uh, and, and that kind of thing. So on that note, thank you very much. We will see you next week when we will talk cheese again. Keep on the curd. Thank you. Oh, bye-bye. 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 End broadcast. Marvellous.